My name is Rick Thompson. Um, Privileged as pastor here at Living Water Community Church. I want to welcome you. And I want to welcome those who are joining us online. I want to start out with a question. Like, have you ever, have you ever been told about somebody, or you had someone describe to you, and then when you met that person, it wasn't exactly the way it was described. I mean, it happened to me when, um, maybe three years ago, two years ago. I was told about a particular person. I I ended up going to a wedding with this person and ended up at the same table with this person. And weddings aren't 20 minutes. The the reception, it's hours. So you really get to know somebody after a few hours of talking. And because the picture that I was told about them was, after I talked to them, it was like totally different. It was like totally different. And so have you ever had that happen to you where, where... People have described you to other people, and then you've walked into a situation and you felt kind of weird because they're treating you differently based on the picture that somebody else painted of you, but it's not really who you are. One of our students today, I I decided to go uh, talk with him today. He's very quiet, and uh, so I figured, you know what? He's been here for a few years, and he doesn't say much, okay? I think I can count maybe five words he said in, in, in five years, okay? So I started asking him about himself, and he told me about himself. He said, you know, he likes to, his favorite color is purple. He, he likes to ride BX bikes. I said, what's your, what's your favorite, um, what's your favorite uh, class in school? And right, right away, Mama said, it's civics for him. And I looked at him, and I said, it, it's not civics, is it? He, he said, no, PE, PE. <laughs> and so, so even sometimes our own mama don't know us as well as we think we can, right? Well, in, in this series, in this series, what I like about this series is the name of the series is called I Am. I Am. And, and it basically says, I am all you need. But rather than hearing about Jesus, in this series, we're going to hear how Jesus describes himself. Is that Okay. And, and so rather than how other people describe him, and some, and some of us have our preconceived ideas of how other people describe him, but in this series, we're going to take the I am statements that Jesus made, and he is actually going to describe himself for us. So in the next few weeks, we're going to get to know Jesus, amen? And, and make sure that you're here, because if you want to know who he is, we're going directly to those statements where he says, I am. And then we're going to talk about what he says and how he describes himself. So he says, uh, and this series seeks to establish really two things. One, who Jesus is, and two, what he does, or, 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 or how who he is relates to you and relates to me. To understand both these questions, we kind of have to go back to the beginning, to the original place where we hear that term, I am. We got to go back to Genesis. And in the book of Genesis, Moses has this encounter with God who is speaking to him through a burning bush. And this is what it says. And and God's about to commission him to to do an important task. And Moses wants to know, well, you're sending me, but why are they even going to listen to me? Who who should I say is is sending me? And so Moses said to to God in Exodus chapter 3, verse 13, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? Verse 14, and God says to Moses, I am who I am. I am who I am. This is what you ought to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. Now again, who is Moses talking to? Help me out, somebody. He's talking to God. He's talking to God. And, and, and God is letting, letting Moses know that when people ask who, who's sending you, tell them I am. I, I love that because whenever I hear I am, it, t- it speaks to me of a, of a present God. He didn't say I was or I will be. He says I am. I'm the one that's, that's coming to you right now. He goes on to say in verse 15, God also says to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. The name you shall call me from generation to generation. 
In other words, the entire Israelite people traced their lineage back to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, back to those family members. It was God who called Abraham, and then he blessed him and his wife, and he promised that their seed would be like the sand on the seashores, and, 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 or like if you look up to heaven, you're going to have as many offsprings as, a, as the star, if you can count the stars. Uh, and, and that's the Israelite people. My wife traces her DNA. Many of some of you in this room trace your DNA right back to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. The God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob was the one that blessed those and started that lineage. Tell them I am is sending you. The same one who has been leading your fathers and your forefathers from the beginning, the same one who's been blessing you all this time is the one who's speaking to you and sending you to them. And so now we fast forward a few thousand years and a lot of that promise has taken place. They've gone from Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and they've multiplied to uh, 12 tribes and now there's thousands, perhaps millions of them at this point that are alive on the planet. Uh, and so Jesus steps onto the scene at just the right time and, and now he's making some statements that are causing some controversy with the people he's trying to reach, his own Israelite people. So he's addressing a, a hostile crowd, and this is what he says in John chapter 8, verse 48. It says, the Jews answered him, aren't we right in saying that you are a Samaritan and, and demon-possessed? And you need to know, when everyone used that term Samaritan, when the Jews used the term Samaritan, it wasn't a compliment. They're, they're insulting Jesus. And then Jesus responded in 40, verse 49, I'm not possessed by a demon, said Jesus but I honor my father and you dishonor me. I'm not seeking my own glory for myself, but there's one who seeks it and he is the judge. Very truly I tell you, whoever obeys my word will never see death. At this they exclaim, now we know that you're demon possessed because Abraham died and so did the prophets. Yet you say that whoever obeys your word will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham? He died. And so do the prophets. Who do you think you are? That's a good question for everybody to answer concerning Jesus. Jesus replied, if I glorify myself, my glory means nothing. My father, whom you claim is your God, is the one who glorifies me. Though you do not know him, I know him. If I said I did not, I'd be a liar like you. But I do know him. And I obey his word. Listen, listen. Your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. Verse 57. You're not yet 50 years old, they said to him. And you've seen Abraham? Very truly, I tell you, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born. Help me out. I am. At this, they picked up stones to stone him. But Jesus hid himself, slipping away from the temple grounds. The question to you this morning is, why upon hearing Jesus say that, did they decide they wanted to stone him? because Jesus was saying something that every Jewish person familiar with the history of their nation would know exactly what he was saying. Before Abraham, their father, was born. He says, your father rejoiced to see my day. And God put Abraham in a prophetic trance and showed him a vision of what's coming, of the coming Messiah. He said, your father rejoiced to see my day. Before Abraham was, I am. You're not even 50 years old. How could you say that? Before he was, I am. John 10, verse 31. Again, his Jewish opponents picked up stones to stone him. But Jesus said to them, I have shown you many good works from the father. For which of these do you stone me? Listen, we're not stoning you for any good work, they replied, but for blasphemy. Because you, being a mere man, 
claim to be God. You see, the people who heard Jesus speak back then understood full well what Jesus was saying. There was no ambiguity. They may not have accepted what he was saying, but they understood what he was saying. So when Jesus used that I am statement, <laughs> and there were many that he used, he wasn't just using it like you and I would use it. He was using it speaking from a place of ancient authority. Before Abraham was, was I am. You tell them the God of the I am is sending him. I am that I am. The God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Before Abraham was, in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. And the word became flesh and he made his dwelling among us and we beheld his glory as the only begotten son of God. Come on, somebody. And so, when he reveals himself, it impacted them. And they knew what he was saying. He was putting himself on the same level as the father. And they wanted to stone him for the blasphemy. He's telling us who he is. And he tells us what he does. And over the next few weeks, he tells us, he uses that statement, I am, at least eight times. We're going to cover them. At least eight times. And my hope is by the end of this series, we're going to get a really good understanding of who Jesus is and what he can do and how he impacts all of our lives and the fact that we all truly need him. Amen? The title of this morning's message is, I am the bread of life. And we hear Jesus saying that in John chapter 6, verse 35. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. And so Jesus declares for us, one of his first I am statements is, that I am the bread of life. What was he saying? First of all, we all know the importance of bread. It, 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 it was evident throughout all of history and all of mankind. Every, it's a staple of life. Practically every culture has some form of bread in it. Did you know that? From the beginning of time until now, bread is a staple of life. And, even, and it, was, it was important. It's important today. It was important back then. Everybody ate it. Everybody needed it, and everybody wanted it. In fact, particularly back then, in many places in the world, without bread, you could die. Without bread, you, you'll end up emaciated. To those of us who have an abundance of it, we, in our culture, we don't see it as a big deal. In fact, a lot of us, we throw away bread. I mean, you, 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 it, show that video really quick. I mean, dumpsters full of bread. Go to the next one. Yeah. At some of these places, bread just gets thrown out, right? Back in our country, you need to know this. Half of the produce that we produce in this country is trashed, gets thrown away. How many know that that's not true in most undeveloped countries? That's only true in Western civil civilizations where we throw away food. Bread, in most places, is an absolute necessity for survival. No one is throwing it away. And no one threw it away back in those days either. So when Jesus declared himself the bread of life, what was he saying? He was saying just like bread is absolutely essential for us to live physically, so too having and maintaining a relationship with Jesus Christ is critical to our spiritual survival. Amen? Wasn't it Jesus that said when he was tempted by the devil, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Bread is important to physical life, but God is important to our spiritual life. Amen? And if you're living a life without God in your life, you are, you are starving spiritually. You are becoming malnourished spiritually. Does that make sense? 
fact, in the same passage, Jesus drew an important contrast that's necessary for all, all of us to see. You see, the reason he made that declaration, I am the bread of life, was because the crowds were seeking to forcefully uh, uh, make him their king. The original crowd we talked about, they were upset with him. But this crowd, after spending some time with Jesus, they wanted to make him king. Why they want to make him king, someone would say, isn't that a good thing? Well, on its face, it might be a good thing. But the reasons why they were doing it were not a good reason. Yes, Jesus should be our king, but if you're, if you're going after, you, it is possible to go after Jesus for all the wrong reasons. Did you know that? And so it's important to distinguish what the right reasons are and what the wrong reasons are. Clearly, the crowd was seeking him for the wrong reasons. You see, Jesus had just done a notable miracle. He had just taken five loaves and two fish. He blessed it, and there was masses that were listening to him. He blessed it, and the Bible says he ended up feeding 5,000 people, 5,000 men, which means there were also women and children. So possibly up to 10 or 15,000 people. And the Bible says when he was done doing this miracle, there was about 12 baskets full of barley loaves that were left. And when the people saw it, they figured, oh, wow, this is awesome. This could be our guy. This, we we want to make someone like this our king because we won't have to work for another day in our lives in terms of bread. Jesus was going to be our meal ticket. So Jesus saw what was going on, and mind you, he did this miracle to reveal who he is, but instead they were starting to follow him for what they can get from him in terms of the bread. So Jesus retreats from, from there. He goes to the other side of the lake with his disciples, but the search was on. They had been fed, they had a little bit, and they wanted more. Now remember last week, I told you that everyone's in search of something. How many know that? Everyone is in search of something, whether it's power or prestige or position. Well, in this case, let's just say they're in search of spiritual pastries or Panera bread, if you want, okay, or pumpernickel bread. And they reason if I could just get a hold of him and get him to keep doing this little trick in their life for the rest of their life, they will be set. And so in John chapter 25, John chapter 6, verse 25, it says, they found him on the other side of the lake, and they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? And Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, you are looking for me not because you, not because you saw a miraculous sign, because all of what Jesus did, every sign, were signs to point them to the fact of who he was. He was trying to let them know who he is. He says, you're not following me because of the signs, but because you, listen, listen, you ate the loaves and had your fill. You ate the loaves and had your fill. And so he says to them, do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. On him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Then they asked him, what must we do to do the works God requires? And Jesus answered, the work of God is this, listen, to believe in the one he has sent. So they asked him, what miraculous sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? Now mind you, he just did a miraculous sign. <laughs> what, what are you going to do that we might believe you? What will you do? Our forefathers ate the manna in the desert as it is written. You remember the story uh, 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 of Moses and and then wandering the desert, and manna from heaven came down, just enough for the day. If they took more, too much, it, it, it spoiled. So he said, they're coming back, says, well, this is what our forefathers did. Find my spot again. Our forefathers ate the manna in the desert, as is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. And Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, it is not Moses who, who has given you the bread from heaven, but it's my father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, from now on, give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, declared help me out, somebody. I am. I am the bread of life. 
He who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me, and still you do not believe. Again, have you ever had a conversation with someone, and you think you're talking about the same thing, but you're not exactly talking about the same thing? I read this, and it reminds me of that old Abbott and Costello little thing, who's on first? What's on second? I don't know, third base. And they keep going round and round. That's what it feels like to me. Because Jesus is talking about one thing, and they're hearing something else, and they keep going round and round about the same subject, but not really meeting, meeting of the minds. That's what I think is going on here. It goes on, it says, they want Jesus to perform another miracle in the likes of the manna from heaven. Why? To, who, who, who sustained the children of the Israelites. If you did it once, perhaps you can do it again if you wouldn't mind. <laughs> and if you can do it for the next 17 years, that would be even better because I won't have to deal with trying to figure out bread. Do what Moses did. So Jesus replied, Moses, the servant of God, didn't provide the manna. God did. God provided the manna. And now God is sending you the true bread that is from heaven again, and, he's, and this bread is going to lead you to eternal life. Okay, give us that bread. Here I am. No, I want the bread. Here I am. No, the eternal bread. That's what I mean. That's what I mean too. I'm right in front of you. Listen, man. I've come all this way. We were on one side of the lake, and I've been over there. It ain't a little lake. It's a big, huge lake. And now we've made our way to the other side of the lake, and we're in search of the bread. You know that kind that's fresh and hot and right out of the oven? I saw you do it yesterday. Do it again. And Jesus is basically saying, no, man, you listen. Don't work for the bread. Don't spend your life working for the bread that's going to perish. Work for the bread that's going to bring you eternal life. That's what I want. How do I get it? Believe. Believe in what? Not a what, a who. Believe in the one who God has sent. Who is that? Drum roll, please. I am the bread. In fact, he even went so far to say, unless you eat of my body and drink of my blood, he says, you will have no part of me. And the moment that came out of his mouth, it says, even some of his disciples stepped back and turned and walked away. The total missing of what Jesus is trying to say. The total missing of what was going on. You are looking for physical bread. And that physical bread is going to satisfy you for a moment. And you're going to work hard for that because everything you're living for is just here and now. I'm here to tell you that God has sent something that's going to be eternal in your life, that's going to sustain you from beyond just the here and now. Give me that. I'm right here. I'm right in front of you. I am the bread of life. I want you to write this down. The bread of life is who he is. And in order to partake in who he is, you must receive him into your heart. It's who he is. And in order to receive that, you have to receive him. We talked about that last week, 1 John 5, 12. He who has the Son, help me somebody, has the life. And he who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. When you receive Jesus as the bread of life, you receive four things. And I want you to write these down. First, you receive, when he says, I am the bread of life, you, you receive that which sustains us sustains us. John 6, says, 
For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Who is that that came down from heaven and gives life to the world? Come on. His name is Jesus. And so just like God sustained the Israelites for 40 years in the desert and nothing wore out, he's telling you there's something here that's worth more than that. It's him. He wants you to come into relationship with him. Matthew 6, says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Put me first in your life, and I promise you, he says, I have the ability to sustain you. First means first. It means above all else. It means before your girlfriends or your boyfriends or your career or anything else, if you make God a priority, he says, I'll make you a priority. He has the ability to sustain us. Secondly, the bread has the ability to satisfy us, to satisfy us. In John chapter 6, verse 35, it says, Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Psalms 34, 8 says, Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is he who makes his refuge, takes refuge in him. Anybody willing to testify to the goodness of God in their life? Anybody willing to say and not ashamed to say that, that the moment you accepted Jesus Christ or you've allowed him to, to lead you, that your life started to radically change, amen? Where there were certain anxieties, some of those anxieties have fell off. Where I, I, when God showed up in my life, my life radically changed. And the moment my life started to change, the, the people's lives around me also started to change. I, I, I remember when I was at camp and I was a young person, I got invited to a singles camp. And, I, and I've shared this before, but it's such a powerful testimony. I thought of it last night. But I, at this singles camp, a friend of mine begged her brother to come. And her brother was in trouble. And he said yes to this invitation, almost reluctantly. He wasn't going to show up. And apparently, maybe the second day into this thing or the third day into this thing, there's a couple of us guys, and we were bunking um, in one of the rooms, and she came to the door and said, can you please pray for my brother? He has a big, painful cyst on his ear. And I was about to go to bed. I said, oh, okay. Got out of bed. A couple of us went over to him. We laid hands on him, started praying for him for this thing on his ear. Now, can I just be honest with you? I was all of maybe 19 20, I wasn't half expecting anything to happen. Can I just be honest? I was about to go to bed. We're going to say a prayer, and I'm going to go to bed. Next thing I know, as we're praying for him, he falls to the ground. No one knocks him to the ground. He falls to the ground. In the process of him falling to the ground, he starts to manifest spirits. And so now we're praying, not for a healing, but we're praying for a deliverance. And we're praying that these things, whatever is controlling him, will be broken off of him. And some time goes by, and where I was ready to go to bed, now I'm in a full-blown deliverance on a person who I don't even know, okay? And there's a struggle. So several of us start to pray, we continue to pray, and he's Wrestling going back and forth. And, some, and you know, sometimes, you know, Jesus said, couldn't you tarry with me just one hour? People start to, you know, fade away because it's, you know, it's becoming now a little bit tedious. Maybe about 45 minutes, an hour goes by, and I'm still there. Just a couple of us left, still praying. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, this thing breaks, breaks off. I don't know if you've ever seen a deliverance, but sometimes, at some point, that thing just, it releases. And the look on their face is like totally different. It's like you're dealing with a totally different person. And he's on the ground, and a tear starts coming from his eye, and I was right there with my hand over him, and he grabs my hand, and he takes it to his mouth, and he kisses my hand. Awkward. And he got up off that floor, and he, in the process, he'd given his life to Jesus. 
because he didn't, he didn't realize that, that stronghold was broken off from him, and now he had a heart that was receptive to the Lord. At the time, I was in a Christian band, and because I guess I was instrumental in his deliverance, he, he, he wanted to be my friend, and he started kind of following us around and found out that he had a voice that this, that this dude could sing. And so whenever we do our band thing, we, we found out he couldn't warm up the crowd. And so he started, he started singing for Jesus, following us around. He eventually fell in love with my backup singer in our group. They got married. Or oh, the next day, that thing on his ear burst. Hello. And then as we do, you get older, you know, you, you get married, you go in different directions. We, we went in different directions and kind of lost touch with him. It was the days before Facebook and, and, you know, MySpace and all this other stuff. And a friend of ours, 10 years later, was having a birthday party, Sof Sophia. She's gone home to be with the Lord, my wife's best friend at the time. And it was on a yacht. And she invited a bunch of her old friends, and we were there. I was married now at this point, and a couple of babies. And he came, and the, he showed up on the thing, and we're along with his wife. He's been married now for 10 years, and he comes up to He says, hey, Ricky. This, before I had a son, Ricky, that people used to call me Ricky, um, before I became Rick or Ricardo. Yeah. So that's the, that's the problem of having, you know, seconds and thirds, because... The person who loses their name is, never mind. Anyway, Ricky, how you doing? We came, he says, and we start talking, him and his wife, and my, my wife and I, he, and he brings up that night, that day. He says, Ricky, do you remember that day? And my response to him is, yes, yes, Gilbert. I, it's not every day that a man kisses my hands. I just, <laughs> it's, it's hard to forget that day. He says to me, he says, do you? He said, listen, do you, do you know what I was struggling with? I said, 10 years later to that day, I did not know. I never asked him. I did not know. He says, I want you to know that my sister was begging me to go because I was struggling. Suicide, all this other stuff, I was a full-blown crack, crack person, cocaine, an addict. And he says, I barely made it because I... I, said, I remember the sister said, please pray that he comes, please pray that he comes, please pray. I barely made it. And that day, when you guys prayed for me, those things that broke off of me was the addictions. He says, when I got up off that floor, to this day, I've never picked up the substance again. I had, like, no idea. Pastor Rick just wanted to go to sleep. <laughs> but King Jesus showed up. Come on, somebody. King Jesus showed up. <laughs> and he showed up in his life realizing that he was in a dry and desperate place. And that's why I said, when, 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 this is not a game. For some of us, we take this and we say, oh, let me just check off my church box. And then you go about living your life and you're really not living for the Lord. But the moment you get serious about God, he gets serious about you and the presence of God shows up. And even when you're tired, he's still there. Come on, somebody. Even when you're not feeling it, he's still there. And it's not always this about you. It's about what God is trying to do with the people around you, okay? And so this man literally came, and he was a drug-addicted, demon-bound crack person when he came to the thing. And when he, with a big old thing, infection on his ear. And when he got up off that floor, he was totally delivered, totally set free, in his right mind, and following hard after the things of the Lord. Married and, and, and his life to took a totally different course. How many know that we have a God that has the ability to, to sustain us? And we have a God that has the ability to, to, 
to, to satisfy us. Taste and see that the Lord is good. When God shows up, people change and things change. And the same God that was doing miracles back then is the same God who wants to do miracles today. And it's hard. I don't know if I believe it. When you become an eyewitness to these things in your life, for me to deny Jesus and the power of God, I would be a liar. That's what Jesus was trying to say to them. He says, no, if I, if I said I wasn't, if I, if I told you I wasn't who I said I, I, I am, I'd be a liar like you guys. He says, no, I've come from the Father. I am the bread of life. I have the ability to give eternal life to those who will surrender their lives to me. No weapon forced against me shall prosper and the devil has no claim on me. And so when I show up, when there's, when there's a demonic stronghold in place, I believe that Jesus is going to win this one. Amen? Or that Jesus in you is going to win this one. He has the ability to satisfy us. But he also has the ability to save us. In John chapter 6, verse 46, it says, No one has seen the Father except the one who, he, who is from God. Only he has seen the Father. Very truly, I say, tell you, the one who believes, the one who believes has what? The one who believes has what? Has eternal life. Just like my friend, the moment he started believing, God gave him eternal life. The Bible says you pass from death to life. But his life didn't start when he died. Life can start right here. Amen? Things can start to change right now if you start to surrender your life to Christ. And God has that ability to save us, even save us from our, our own sinful patterns if we will surrender to him. I feel like I'm talking to someone in here. Because I'm a, I'm a firm believer in God is not a respecter of persons. God does not love the pastor more than he loves you. God doesn't love the pastor more than he loves the the drunk on the street. God loves you. And then he says, I demonstrated my love for you in this, that while you were yet sinners, not while you were yet churchgoers or Bible quoters or Christian T-shirt wearers or bumper stickers on your car or, 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 or life group, all that stuff is great. It's a byproduct of me being a, a follower of Christ. I got my T-shirt and a I know a few scriptures now, and I, I, I've even had the bumper stickers on my car. But my Bible says God demonstrated his love for me that while I was yet a sinner, an enemy of him, God doesn't give me what I deserve. He gave me what I needed. He gave me grace. He demonstrated his love for me while I was a screw-up. Some of us were in the mentality that I got to get my stuff together before I get right with God. No, no. If you can get your stuff together, you probably would have done it already. You come just as you are, and God will help you get your stuff together. Come on, somebody. He will help you get your stuff together because you are presenting a broken and contract heart, you're humbling yourself. I talked to someone this week, and literally the Bible says, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And if you're proud and you're arrogant, you, you will find yourself in opposition to God, in battle with God. And I told him this week, I just, I don't know anyone who's won a battle with God. Do you? I mean, God could just say it's over. What are you going to say? I'll just take my breath back now. Thank you very much. And so he opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble, which means that when I humble myself before him, there's nothing but grace and forgiveness 
and love and that attaboy, you can do this from heaven. You got this. And then when I stumble, if I stumble, it's not a you big dummy, you idiot, what's wrong with you? Just, just get up. I believe in you. Just get, get back up. Keep, keep walking. Keep going forward. That stronghold in your life, that thing is coming off. You see, people may judge you by where you're at today, but God knows the future. God sees you in the future. I heard a prophet say that one time. He said, I see you in the future, and you look much better than you do right now. Come on, somebody. And so don't make all your judgments based on today. That's just chapter two in a big old, you know, novel about of grace that God is writing in your life. Shared with a couple I love. I love that God in the Bible highlights the giants, the giant slayers, and the, and the Elijahs, and all these strong, prominent, godly men and women. But it also lets you know what their weaknesses were, too. Amen? To let, let, to let us know that these were just men and women who placed their trust in God, and it wasn't their goodness that sustained them. It was his goodness that sustained them and the grace of God that's on his life. And God is not a respected person. The same God who gives grace to the Moseses and to the Elijahs and to the, to the Samsons and all these people, the same God is giving grace to us. But if you stand in opposition to him, he's letting you know, I oppose the proud, but I give grace to the humble. Amen? Walk in God's grace. He has the ability to save us. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. John 10, 27. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my, hand, my Father's hands, and I and the Father are one. This is the last one. That the I am, the bread of life, has the ability to secure us. Amen? That, that God has the ability to keep what, what belongs to him. No one has the ability to take you out of the Father's hand. Not the devil, not sin, not adversity, not anything can take you out of the Father's hands once you place your trust in him. Does that make sense? So when Jesus says, I am the bread of life, the bread that Jesus offers is, has the ability to sustain us, to satisfy us, to save us, and to secure us. And so much more than just having my earthly appetites met. If you are living just to have your earthly appetites met, like the crowds of old who are following Jesus for all the wrong reasons, like he's some kind of you know, Panera bread in the sky or ATM, he says, you're working for the stuff. Don't spend your life working for the stuff that's just going to perish. He says, don't do that. He says, spend your life working for that which is going to lead to eternal life. He said, well, how do we do that? How do we, how do we do that? He says, believe. Believe in the one whom God has sent. One of our young students, they did a, a poetic reading on I am the bread of life. I want you to listen to it, and then I'm going to give you an invitation that if you've not yet surrendered your life to Jesus and meant it, that today would be your day. Listen to this. Do you believe God says a single syllable in vain? John 6, 35, God says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never go thirsty. So why do we continually pursue after things of this world? This world that holds empty promises, hatred, 
sin. He is asking you, when will I be enough? I have promised you all you could ever need. Retreat to me and you will never hunger nor thirst. Five loaves and two fish fed five thousand men. You are one person. What is the reason you can't be satisfied in God? I assure you, it is not because he isn't offering the right things. But what is it you are asking of God? Better yet, what is it you aren't asking of God? Give him everything you have. For we are nothing more than beggars on a street and we have found bread, which in our state of life could save our life. Share this bread. If there was more where it came from, wouldn't you tell everyone you know? Jesus is this bread. He is the only person that will satisfy you for the rest of your days. So your search ends here. It's time to come home, child. Here is the bread of life God is saying to you. Come to me and you will never hunger again. Come to me and you will never thirst again. You have seen God move. You have encountered him, but you still wonder. You still question. You were brought to Jesus by divine intervention. And Jesus himself says, whoever is brought to him by the Father, he will never drive away. Here is the bread of heaven that is being offered to you. Take it. You need it. I need it. You are enough because he is enough. I'm going to ask the ushers, I mean the altar team to come on up here while they come up. They asked him, give me the bread. His response was, I am the bread. Don't let your walk with God come down to just what you can get from him. He wants you to want him. And once you have him, you have it all. I am all you need. Manna is good, but God is better. Amen? Amen? So here's the big question. What are the things you've been working for? I believe the Holy Spirit is talking to you and calling you right now. If you recognize that there's something missing and you want to rectify that, the invitation goes out to you the same way it went out to the children of Israel. It says you're working for stuff that's going to perish. And some of us are exhausting ourselves working for stuff. But in the end, it's not going to mean a hill of beans. He says you need to work of the stuff you need to go in search of that which will sustain you not just in this life but in the life to come so show us how to find that one what do we do to get that work he says believe believe in the one whom God has sent the true and living bread from heaven God is asking you to Put your trust completely in him. And so I'm going to ask everyone to kind of bow their heads, close their eyes. And if that's your desire, if you're here today and you've not yet trusted Christ as your Savior and your Lord, and you would like to, why don't you say something like this? Say, Heavenly Father, I come before you today I ask you to forgive me for my sins, to come into my life, to come into my heart. Tell them I, I, I want the bread from heaven. I, I don't just want what you can give to me. I want you. I want the bread of life. The Bible says to taste and see that the Lord is good. And Lord, I want you in my life. Forgive me of my sins. Come into my life and come into my heart. 
Some of you need to, you've said that prayer before, but you're straight away, you need to recommit your life right now. Say, Lord, I, I commit, I recommit. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If you prayed that prayer with me and you meant it, only those who meant it, just slip up your hand. Say, that was me today. I pray. I see your hand. I see your hand. I see your hand. Is there anybody else? I see your hand. I see you in the back. I see you. I see you. And those who are listening online, I don't have to see you. God sees you. God knows. 